Let's go forward here. Okay, good. So I'm going to minimize this. Okay, so a uh, mm, couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, the surveys here, uh, the, on the schedule side, just very quickly today, uh, we're gonna work on the ideas of measurement of photovoltaics. The lecture notes are posted. We will, at, after, so this will be somewhat of a shorter lecture. Uh, I think in the last half hour of the class, uh, after them we'll work out the midterm solutions in class. So uh, please pay attention, that way you can uh, see where you might have made mistakes and, and refresh yourself on the, basically the first half of the class. On Thursday, we'll talk about spectrum splitting, which is a very, very interesting and exciting area of research and some very interesting technologies. Next week, uh, we'll go into the physics of solar cells. Uh, and then after that, we're going to start focusing on commercialization for the rest of the, uh, well, except for another uh, couple of lectures um, uh, of the semester. So keep that in mind and also make sure you are <clears throat> actively working on your assignment three. This is uh, probably the most critical assignment, as I said before, the instructions are here. Uh, it is on November 15th. So please uh, start working on it early. Great. And if there are no questions, let's get started with here. And, uh, let's see if I can. How do I minimize this? There we go. Maybe I can put it there. Okay, perfect. So today we're going to talk about the measurement of photovoltaics. And uh, particularly photovoltaics, we refer to solar cells. So we're going to uh, talk primarily about current voltage uh, measurements. So there's a few other things we will talk about. This is more of a practical uh, knowledge uh, that you should have uh, having taken this class. So we'll, we'll talk about some specific things that are important. First of all, in, a, in any solar cell, what we are doing is measuring current as a function of voltage, right? So uh, what does that mean? That means keep in mind the solar cell is a reverse bias PN junction, as you will see next week. So what that means is that we have essentially a current voltage. So it's a reverse bias PN junction means it, uh, um, it's a diode, right? When it's reverse bias, the current should not flow. But in the presence of light, some charge carriers are created, which will allow current to flow. So that's why typically the current is measured in the negative direction because the, the junction is reverse biased. But of course, that's just a ter uh, terminology, right? So as long as you know what's happening. So, so what happens is you apply a voltage, which is shown by this U, the horizontal curve. We say a specific voltage, it's a reverse bias PN junction, so it's a reverse voltage. And then light is incident on it, on this device, and some charge carriers are created, and that causes a current, which is shown here. And you change the bias voltage, you get a different current. Change the bias voltage, you get a different current, and so on and so forth. As you increase the reverse bias voltage, of course you are reducing the current you're forcing the current to essentially go to zero. So that's why this curve looks like that, right? Now, there are three important points to keep in mind, and we'll reiterate this a couple of times. First, what happens when there is open circuit? In other words, when there is zero current. So the current is zero, which is this line right here, and that's the point. And that means the circuit is open, no current is flowing, and of course, we can still measure voltage across the terminals of the PN junction, and we call that an open circuit voltage, okay? And that is an important metric of a solar cell. On the other extreme, we have something called a short circuit current. This is the location where the voltage is zero, right? So the terminals are short circuited, and then you get some current flowing through it. You get the maximum current flowing through it. It's called ISC, or short circuit current. So there's two important extremes. Then in between, we have what's referred to as an optimal working point. Okay, we'll see what that means in a second. And that is, deter that is um, labeled by something called a fill factor, FF. 
Now we can of course flip the curves so it looks more natural. So the current is just flipped up. So it looks like that. It's the same red curve as we saw before. This is a very nice solar cell, by the way, because it has this really squarish shape to this red curve. Uh, of course, we are interested in power. So power is this blue curve. Power is computed as P is voltage times current. So it takes the current, multiplied by the voltage, you get the curve, which looks like that. And clearly you see an optimum value, a maximum value here. Okay, so this P max, this is really where you want to operate your solar cell because that's the maximum power you're getting out of it, right? So this is referred to as the optimum operating point or the maximum operating point. And you can see that somewhere in between zero volts and open circuit voltage, okay? That's that number. And this, by the way, will depend on the load that the solar cell is, is, uh, is drawing. Okay, so if you're connecting this to a battery charger or if it's connected to a car engine, for instance, right, or whatever. So that will determine this location here, just from a pure simple electric circuits point of view. Not, not terribly important for, for this class, but something you should be aware of. The term for fill factor is, is, a, is the ratio of this rectangle here, this dark purple rectangle, which represents this optimum operating point of the IV curve, divided by the area of this big rectangle outside, which represents the best case operating point, ideal case, which is open circuit voltage multiplied by the short circuit current. So the fill factor is I times V at the best operating point, divided by ISC times VOC, which is the area A divided by area of the rectangle B. So you can see, that the higher the fill factor, the more power uh, you can get out of this solar cell, the more squarer this curve looks. So the fill factor is sort of a quality metric of the solar cell. And it's somewhat independent of the technology of the solar cell itself. You know, whether it's using light trapping or whether it's using gallium arsenide, whether it's using silicon, whatever. Okay, so the fill factor is a really nice metric to keep in mind. Of course, to do these measurements, we need to also account for the illumination itself, right? So um, there are many ways to do the illumination. We saw this before. We can have um, intensity, which is in watts per meter square. You can have the spectrum, and you can also have temperature of the cell. All of these are important parameters that affect the measurements. Intensity, of course, if you're doing it on Earth, you want to make sure it's about 1,000 watts per meter squared. For spectrum, you know, there's a standard spectrum, AM1.5. We've talked about that before. And temperature cell is typically at 25 degrees, room temperature. If you're doing concentrated solar, typically the intensity is much larger than 1,000 watts per meter squared. Of course, scaled by the concentration factor, as we have seen before, and we'll see again. Uh, the spectrum typically is the direct part of the spectrum, not the global part of the spectrum, because when you concentrate sunlight, you usually can only concentrate the direct part of the spectrum. We know this from the acceptance angle limitation of a concentrator, right? We've seen this in the design of the CPC, for example. And usually you go to a slightly higher temperature because of the higher intensities of light that are focused on the solar cell. For space applications, or if you're in a different um, planet, let's say like Mars or something like that, then you have to use a different intensity, clearly, right? So, you know, if you're building solar panels for a deep space probe, that would be a very different solar cell than you would to put panels on your roof, right? And they're both equally important, but very different design criteria. Uh, uh, right outside Earth in space, we use AM0 spectrum, as we've seen before. And temperature, uh, it depends also you know, where you are. <clears throat> there are some standards as well. Uh, NOCT refers to a nominal operating cell temperature. So it de really depends on, on some of these standards. There are, of, of course, a few different standards people use. Um, the other important parameters for measurements are the area. How do we define the collection area? And this is important for efficiency because we talk about aerial uh, power, uh, current density, for instance, or power density, right? Because you want to normalize the area. 
For non-concentrated cells, the entire area of the cell is used typically, including the area covered by grids and contacts. So it's, uh, it's important. So if you're trying to compare two different cells, it's very important we understand very clearly, you know, what is the area that's used? Does it include the grids and contacts, which of course uh, are basically shadowing the active area, right? The grids and contacts don't create current. They're simply there to block the light somewhat, right? Of course, they're there to collect the current, but they can block the light. For con concentrated cells, the area illuminated uh, uh, the aperture is used. So we've seen this many times before, for instance, when we look at concentrated, concentration, concentrated PB, we have to consider the input area of the CPC, right? So that's why that, that's also quite important. Concentra the measurement of con concentrated PB is much more complex than that of non-concentrated PB, generally speaking. Uh, we always have to do some calibration in order to measure efficiencies. And efficiency measurement for solar cells is fairly complex. Uh, in fact, uh, one thing I should point out is that there are only a handful of places in the world that can certify efficiency of solar cells. Um, uh, one of them, of course, is the, the National Renewable Energy Labs. Uh, and there's a couple of, there's a place in Germany, there's one in Japan, and I believe there's one more in the US uh, somewhere else. But in general, what you have to do is you need to know what the actual incident power is uh, because that has to be calibrated very carefully because if you don't know what's incoming into the system, then your efficiency calculations will be wrong. So generally speaking, this is done um, at, uh, you know, to do it in a certified manner, you have to do it at some of these uh, standards uh, labs, stand, uh, labs that concentrate, you know, that are focused on standards. However, if you're working in a lab or a company or something like that, you can use what's called a reference cell. So the reference cell is a solar cell, typically a silicon cell, whose short circuit current has been very carefully calibrated with respect to a very specific known reference spectrum. And this is something we can buy. And then we can use that as a reference to calibrate against. So let's see how that's done. Uh, before we do that, we, we know, uh, we've, we've seen this before, uh, we know that the air mass is also important. I won't go through this, but we know air mass 1 refers to directly overhead. Air mass 1.5 is kind of what we generally use as a standard, of course. Um, so secant of theta, 1 over cos theta represents the path length of the light through the air mass. Um, and uh, the, the intensities can vary and the spectrum can vary drastically based on clouds, pollution, et cetera. We, we all know this, so I'm gonna skip that a little bit. Now, the, the spectrum, as I said before, we need to use a reference cell to get the actual measurements and we need to normalize the spectrum very, very carefully. This turns out to be very important when we do, for instance, spectrum splitting, and we'll come back to this in the next lecture. But basically speaking, uh, the, the, the math is relatively simple, but it's something we all have to be very careful about. So imagine we want to scale the short circuit current density. Okay, let's do a quick example. This is a short circuit current uh, of, not density, sorry, current of the test cell under a reference spectrum. Okay, T is the test cell, R is the reference spectrum. SC is the short circuit current. So this is something we have to estimate. Okay, because we have the test cell, but we don't have the reference spectrum. That's it. So in that case, we have to first take the short circuit current of the test cell under a source spectrum. That is a source spectrum that we do have. So this we can measure. Okay. Divide by a factor M, which is called a spectral mismatch factor, which we'll come to in a second. Multiply by this ratio. So this is simply the short circuit current of a reference cell, this R, under a reference spectrum, this is known, okay, when we buy the reference cell, divided by so short circuit current density, the uh, current of a reference cell under the source spectrum. This one we can measure because we have the source. Okay, this is given to us by the company that sells us the reference cell. This is something we can measure, this is something we can measure, this is something we can calculate. So putting it all together, we can get the short circuit current of a test cell under a reference spectrum. This is what we're trying to do because we're trying to get the reference uh, measurement 
sorry, in a, in, sorry, we want to measure, we want to estimate the short circuit current of a test cell under a reference spectrum, which we don't have. Okay, so what's the spectrum mismatch factor? It's simply a way to compute or adjust the spectral response of the cell. So it's not the source spectrum itself that matters, it's also how the cell responds is also important. So that's what the spectral mismatch factor does. So here we have several integrals and let's just look at one of them. So here we have the source, uh, the spectrum. So the E refers to the spectrum of the source. This R refers to reference or S refers to source. That is source means it's the spectrum we have. Reference is a spectrum that's used in a standard which we don't have easy access to. This SR refers to the spectral response under a reference spectrum. <clears throat> uh, sorry, spectral response of with a reference cell or a test cell. Okay, so you have an R or a T. So this spectrum multiplied by the spectral response and an integral over all the wavelengths of interest will give us essentially how many charge carriers are created. Okay, so this integral gives us how many charge carriers are created. So this is the reference cell under the reference spectrum divided by reference cell under the source spectrum. Okay, this one we don't know. We have, I mean, we have to be provided by the standards. This one we can measure. This one is known to us. It's provided. It's a reference spectrum, spectral response. So this ratio we can actually compute. Same thing here exactly the same analysis here, except that now we replace the reference spectrum with the test spectrum, test cell. So spectral response of the test cell, which again we can measure, okay, multiply by the source spectrum, which we know, the reference spectrum of it, which is provided to us, and the spectral response of the test cell. Again, this, so, so for example, this integral tells us how many, how much current is generated or how many charge carriers are generated by the test cell under the source spectrum. Okay, so it's a way of normalizing the data so we can account for the spectral mismatch factor here. And you can put it all together, it will make sense from a simple normalization point of view. The, the reason to do all this so carefully is because the short circuit current density, a short circuit current, is very dependent on the actual spectrum that's used and we may not have access to a reference spectrum. So we need to be able to compute it based on these normalization techniques. Now, there are a few other things. So, so this is just to drive home the point of the importance of the spectrum of light. And we'll come back to this when we talk about spectrum splitting. Uh, in order to estimate the, the, the efficiency of a solar cell, it's very, very important to understand what is the spectrum of the light that is used to estimate the efficiency of a solar cell. A few other things to be aware of. Um, uh, there are some artifacts that happen in the current voltage curves. One uh, simple example is a hysteresis. So in other words, if you measure current as a function of voltage, and let's say you're biasing the voltage, increasing it from zero to some value, you will see the current drops. Now, if you start decreasing the voltage going back, you will see that the curve starts going in a different direction, okay? So this is a form of hysteresis, right? Doesn't follow the same curve. Of course, this is problematic because we don't know now what is the correct current voltage curve. The steady state is actually shown here. So the way to avoid this is of course to really do a much slower measurement, right? To slow this whole thing down so all the carriers have time to essentially uh, diffuse through the system uh, uh, and reach the terminals. Of course, the other option is to measure steady state, which is measure the current at a fixed voltage. So instead of sweeping the voltage, you measure at a given voltage, get the current, move over, measure at another fixed voltage, and so on and so on. Of course, that's much slower, but then you can get the most accurate measurement. So the is something that occurs. The other thing to keep in mind is that in some materials, we end up with a situation where the current voltage curves change with exposure to light. In other words, the intensity can affect the current voltage curve. Some nonlinear effects happen. Some of these effects are not fully understood. It's still uh, lots of research is going on, but this is something we should be aware of. And people do things like light soaking. Um, for instance, uh, I was actually visiting a company that produces um, SIGs, uh, so thin film cells. Uh, 
And this is very, very common in those kinds of materials, uh, these sorts of cadmium sulfide uh, CIS cells. Um, because um, if you don't do light soaking, the, inten the, the efficiency can change drastically based on the intensity of light. So an example is shown here. So if you, if you do a very quick initial exposure to light and measurement, you get an efficiency of let's say 6.6%. But if you expose the light, the cell to about three hours of light and then measure it, it's about 6.9%. Quite a bit of difference here, right? Uh, the fill factor is actually improved. Um, and you can come up with models that affect it. Uh, but like I said, when I visited the company, you actually see things like this. You, they, they leave this uh, cell under a huge uh, lamp for many hours before they actually package and sell it. And this is fairly common in these CIS cells, uh, thin film cells. To, not so much for silicon cells. So something to be aware of. Of course, uh, when we test cells, we always have to contact them. So we have to solder on wires like these, which means that we are always adding series resistance, which has nothing to do with the performance of the cell itself, but the series resistance can affect our measurements. So we should be very aware of this. As electrical engineers, we know the way to avoid this is to do four probe measurements, so you can balance out. I won't go into the details, but uh, just be aware that the, the contact resistance uh, of what you know, how you make contact to the solar cells is quite important and then you characterize them. So four probe measurements can overcome these limitations. So typically uh, when people do four probe measurements, another thing to keep in mind is that you can also, you, you have to do very careful bond, pan, bond pad contacts as shown here. Uh, some of you who have worked with uh, chips or printer circuit boards are familiar with the gold bar. Uh, your video, uh, your audio went out. Okay. Uh, what did you do? I, I didn't change anything. Can you still hear me? No? Uh, it's very bad. Very bad? <laughs> it's good. Now it's good. Okay, nothing changed, so I'm not sure. Is your Wi Fi okay? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, this is something um, just we should be aware of uh, when we are characterizing solar cells. So the next part of the lecture, I want to focus on instrumentation a little bit. Uh, we should be aware of all the different types of instrumentation used for characterizing solar cells. And there are a few different things. So, and they involve some interesting optical design. So we should, you know, we should understand this from both uh, points of view. First, uh, for the cell measurement, and I, since we saw this, I, let me just point out one quick thing here. This exact same curve we saw, okay, current voltage curve. Uh, generally speaking, people talk about current density. So this is measured in milliamps per centimeter squared. Voltage is, of course, in volts. Uh, and in that case, if we want to measure efficiency, it is, of course, the power output, which is the maximum power out here at this optimal point, divided by power input. Now, for our input, we have to be careful that we account for the concentration factor. So it's concentration factor multiplied by the air, um, uh, area. And in the concentration, concentrated solar irradiance is, of course, this multiplied by any extra concentration that happens because of the CPC or, or Fresnel lens or whatever. So let's just be aware of that. And I'm gonna skip this video, it's not that important. So, um, a solar simulator. So, in, when we characterize solar cells, of course, the best case scenario is to put it outside under ambient sunlight and, and then do the measurements. However, uh, that's not always possible. Of course, when you have cloudy days or you not, know, it's not repeatable, right? Things change and the sun moves and so on. So, in that case, we want to use a solar simulator and we typically want to use a standardized solar simulator, okay? So we can, we can do repeatable measurements. So what does a solar simulator look like? Gen generally speaking, it comes with a lamp. You know, uh, sometimes they use LEDs, but most likely they're lamps. And we'll talk about a few of them. Let's imagine a xenon lamp here. And typically there's a ellipsoidal reflector, which tries to collimate the light from the lamp. Uh, there's a mirror, which redirects the light passes it through what's called an optical integrator, but basically it's an array of micro lenses, 
and that's used to essentially, uh, and they took a pair of them, and they're used to homogenize the beam. So the light from here might not be perfectly uniform. We can use an, uh, a pair of microlens arrays simply to homogenize it or make it uniform. And there's a shutter here, which can be used to turn on, on and off the light. And then there's a spectral correction filter here. This is used to essentially correct the filter, the spectrum of the source in order to match this the spectrum that we want to measure this uh, solar cell at. Another mirror here, which redirects the light down. Okay, and then there's a collimating lens. And then there's a nice uniform white light is illuminating this working plane here where we place the solar cell that's measured. So relatively simple system, but involves some interesting optical designs. The, the lamps that can be used, uh, there are many options. First of all, of course, our goal is to get to AM 1.5 or AM 1, you know, direct sort of uh, spectrum. So which is shown in the dash line here. These are examples from my company called Newport, which makes these uh, QTH is a quartz tungsten lamp. So that's a high, high pressure quartz tungsten lamp. Uh, without a filter, with a filter, you get much smaller version of it. Um, that 3300 3, 3, Kelvin tungsten halogen lamp uh, or quartz tungsten. So you can also use a mercury lamp. The advantage of the mercury lamp is that you get much uh, higher power in the shorter wavelengths. So you can see at the shorter wavelengths, very low power for this uh, halogen lamp, tungsten halogen lamp. But, uh, mercury gives you more, more power at the lower wavelengths. However, it, it has a lot of these peaks because it's mercury vapor. So you get all these atomic transitions, whereas the tungsten halogen lamp is more like a plasma. So you get this very smooth curve, which is, it depends on what you're measuring. So in some cases, this is better. You want, you know, all these high energy photons. So in some cases, it's better to get a smoother spectrum. Um, you can also have a metal halide lamp, which gives you somewhat of a combination of both, uh, a bit more broader spectrum than a mercury lamp, but also gives you these spikes uh, and, and a sufficiently high power in the, in the lower, short wavelengths. But there are lots of options. So uh, one of the important um, other measurements in solar cells is the quantum efficiency. Uh, not just the standard efficiency. So the current voltage curve gives us the overall ef absolute efficiency of the solar cell, but we also need to know what the quantum efficiency of the solar cell is. Now, quantum efficiency is technically defined as the ratio of the number of charge carriers collected by a solar cell to the number of photons of a given wavelength incident on a solar cell. What that means is that let's say 100 photons are incident on the solar cell. Let's say if 50 of 50 um, electrons end up at the terminal creating current. That means this quantum efficiency is 50 divided by 100 or 50 percent. Okay, so that's what the quantum efficiency It's a measure typically of the internal physics of the solar cell. So the, this gives us lots of information about the physics of what's going on inside. Yeah, it is of course an indicator of how good is it intrinsically a solar cell is at converting sunlight to electricity. So ideally, a solar cell should have high spectral response at the wavelengths where there is an abundant number of photons at that incident sunlight. So this is very, very important because you're trying to match now the spectral response or the quantum efficiency to the spectrum of the light that the solar cell is working under. So this is, for instance, important when you think about uh, solar cells that might um, be useful on Earth or it might be used on Mars because the spectrum that the solar cell on Mars might see is quite different than the spectrum it might see on Earth, right, because of the atmosphere. So the quantum efficiency uh, measurement of, uh, we can look at an example, in this case, the monocrystalline silicon solar cell, it looks somewhat like this. So quantum efficiency is in percentage and it's always plotted as a function of wavelength. So generally you see very low quantum efficiency at very, very short wavelengths, and we'll come to why that's in a second, and you increase as you reduce, uh, increase the wavelength, and then you basically have a plateau, and then you decrease again. So uh, for an ideal solar cell, of course, you want to have something which looks like this dash curve, where, where the energy of the photons above the band gap is, everything is absorbed, so you should get 
and beyond the band cap, of course, nothing is absorbed, so you get 0%, right? So this, uh, but the ideal case, of course, doesn't happen. So let's think about the, the non the actual case. So first of all, here, what happens is that the quantum efficiencies reduce a short wavelengths due to short surface recombination. So of course, here, the energy of the photons very, very high. Lots of carriers can be created. I mean, the, the carriers can be created with lots of energy. However, because they are so energetic, they are more also more prone to other um, uh, recombination events, particularly surface recombination is a big problem in silicon. Uh, this means that the defects on the surface of the silicon can cause additional recombination and reduce the efficiency of the cell. So this is why the surface texturing that we talked about for light trapping is a bit of a double-edged sword because that texturing can increase the surface recombination unless you do it very carefully with the correct material. So you can, under, you can do something called passivation, which allows you to reduce this recombination while allowing for extra texture. We don't really have the, the, the physics of, of this is a little bit outside the scope of this class, but just be aware that at very, very high energies or low wa short wavelengths, you also reduce the quantum efficiency. We'll talk a little bit more about this on Thursday. And at this plateau, you also get a little bit of reduction from a 100% ideal case because of some loss of in reflection at the top, some light is simply passing right through the solar cell material, and also there's some diffusion. Uh, if, the, if, you, you know, if the material has defects, some of the carriers may not make it out of the terminals because of the low diffusion loss. So all of that is accounted for here, all of that physics. And then as you get closer to the band gap, of course, the absorption drops. Um, primarily because at long wavelengths you get um, uh, recombination of the rear surface, uh, reduced absorption because you're getting closer to the band gap, and then also the low diffusion length, which happens here as well. So all, this curve, uh, the key thing to remember is that this sort of curve is very useful for us to understand the physics of what's happening inside the solar cell. So people spend a lot of time uh, first of all, measuring these curves very, very carefully and also trying to interpret these curves. So quite, quite important for us to understand at least some of the basics. So just a few um, points to keep in mind, important points here. Uh, when all photons are converted and collected as charge carriers, the quantum efficiency is 100%. Photons with energy less than the band gap are not absorbed, so their quantum efficiency is 0%, so things are obvious. Quantum efficiency is generally reduced due to recombination because the carriers don't reach the terminals. Uh, wavelength is important, so blue light is absorbed close to the front surface because of higher absorption. So recombination of the front surface will affect quantum efficiency of blue wavelengths, which is these are the blue wavelengths. So green light is absorbed mostly in the bulk of the solar cell, so low diffusion length will lower the quantum efficiency for green wavelengths. At redder wavelengths, lower uh, or lower efficient uh, energies, surface recombination of the rear surface, as well as lower diffusion length will lower the quantum efficiency. Uh, quantum efficiency can also be defined as external. External QE includes the effect of optical losses such as transmission through the cell and reflections away from the cell, so from the top surface. The internal QE refers to efficiency after excluding the transmitted and reflected light. This it refers to only the absorbed light can generate charge carriers that in turn generate current. So the internal quantum efficiency is what most people look at because the reflection can be easily computed and removed from the data. This gives us the internal physics of the, of the device. The, the principle of measurement uh, is related to the fact that the band structure in a semiconductor creates wavelength dependent absorption, right? Photons with energy above the band gap is absorbed, and that with energy below the band gap is not. An absorbed photon creates an electron hole pair, which if it reaches the electrodes, creates current. To calculate the quantum efficiency, we need to know the incident power in the cell and its produced current at each wavelength. So currents produced by a test cell and that by a calibrator for the detector are measured. The ratio of the cell current to beam power is the cell responsivity. So the quantum efficiency uh, uh, we know from definition is the number of charge carriers that are collected, so that's the current, divided by the number of incident photons at lambda. So we measure it at a given wavelength. 
So the number of charge carriers is the current divided by the electron charge. That gives us the number of electrons, the number of charge carriers. Number of incident photons is the total incident power divided by the energy of a single photon, it's the over lambda. Okay, so of course we have a reference detector. From the reference detector, we know I over P in, we can write it as R, which is R is the reference photo detector responsibility. So the quantum efficiency can be written as the I cell, which is what we can measure the current, divided by E, divided by I reference divided by R, which gives us the P in, you have SC per lambda, so you can compute this. So the reason for this, by the way, is that this current is something we can measure. This R is also something we can measure because we have a reference cell. We can measure that. HC over lambda is known. Okay, lambda is known. HC are constants. E is the electronic uh, charge, we know that. And I reference is also something we can measure because we have a reference cell. So from these things that we can measure or compute, we can actually calculate the quantum efficiency. The instrumentation itself is also quite interesting um, because we have to measure one wavelength at a time. There's not a lot of light. So we have to do very careful measurements here. So first of all, we have a, um, let's say we start here. We have a light source, which is coupled to a lock and amplifier. Okay, we'll see what that does in a second. We have a filter wheel to, to pick uh, different parts of the spectrum as needed. There's something called a chopper, which is, uh, which is basically a blade that moves, rotates really fast and chops the light into little pulses, uh, very, very high frequencies. And there's a monochromator that selects a single wavelength and then it passes it to the cell under test here or the reference cell. So these can be changed. Then the voltage or the current, the current is converted to a voltage in an amplifier, an amplifier, so you can measure it, okay? And since this is a periodic signal at very, very high frequencies, you lock, and the output is also a periodic signal at the same frequency, you lock the measurement with a phase lock loop and using this lock and amplifier to that frequency, so you can get a very, very precise measurement. So, uh, and then of course you can tune the wavelength to the monochromator. So you measure the current, you measure this I cell very, very precisely as a function of the lambda. The, the tunable light source itself has lots of interesting optics in it. In a, in a very good monochromator, you essentially have two sources, a halogen source and a deuterium source, D2 which refers to very short wavelengths. And they can be selected with this uh, flippable mirror, okay? Um, it's also called a motorized beam steer. And there's some filters here, some focusing elements here, the chopper, uh, another filter wheel. Then there's a slit here. The slit selects a small part of the beam, which then gets collimated by this mirror. So this is just a flat mirror. This is a convex mirror. Uh, sorry, concave mirror that collimates the light, hits a grating, and the grating disperses the light, and the dispersed light is focused again using this concave mirror onto a little exit aperture, usually a slit, that can then be connected to a fiber or a lens or whatever for, for illumination onto a solar cell. Um, a few things to keep in mind here. Uh, there's a lot of detail here, not, not terribly important for us, so I'll kind of go through it quickly. Is that the design uh, for monochromators requires quite a bit of interesting optics uh, because of the very broad band. You need to have very large wavelength rates, right, for, the, for, for solar cells. So you need to design these things more carefully. Uh, the sources, uh, you know, deuterium is used for UV, Quartz tungsten halogen QTH is so visible to infrared, and combining them, you can get the entire solar spectrum. And there's some advantages to them, but however, they also have, they're expensive, they have a short lifetime, so sometimes we prefer to use xenon uh, lamps. Uh, the, there are some interesting coupling optics here. How do you take the light from the source? Uh, you, with a condenser and a planar convex refocusing lens onto the monochromator input slip. And that can be seen in this picture. So here we are focusing the light onto a slit and then 
it is illuminating after a lens which is not shown here onto a grating. And the problem is if this cone angle is too large, then you will overfill the grating and there will be light spilling out on the sides of the grating causing noise. So that will not diffract, that will not disperse light. On the other hand, if you, if you underfill the grating, then you are not using the entire grating and then you'll get less spectral resolution. You won't be able to select the wavelengths more precisely. So there's a very careful design that has to happen to match the size of this grating to the size of the uh, input light that comes into the slit here. And that's the discussion here. So this is kind of similar to the non-imaging optical designs that we've talked about before. This is another example of a non-imaging optical design. Again, not terribly important for us, but just something we should be aware of. Um, and the last thing I want to show you is that we should know and by now appreciate that different solar cells have different, very different responses. So we can compare, for instance, this is responsivity as a function of wavelength. This is the solar spectrum shown in the dark blue here. And the different cells are plotted here. So you can see this dot dashed line is a CIS, copper indium disilinite, can sulfide uh, alloy. Um, basically has the broadest response, okay? So this is sort of a quantum efficiency plot, right? So what this means is that if you take 1200 nanometers, I have about, you know, 70% 70, 70 chance or 72% 70, chance that I will create electron hole pairs. And you can see the same thing for gallium marcinite. Uh, amorphous silicon, this alpha refers to amorphous silicon, not crystalline silicon, and so on and so forth. So, so this uh, different responsibilities for the different cells is very, very important. And this is the reason that we will talk about spectrum splitting in the next lecture. So I want to end here. So you have time for the last uh, part of the class to, uh, for Akrathim to go over the midterm solutions. So let me stop here and see if there are any questions. So the mo uh, before I do that, I guess the most important thing is what I want to take you to take away from today's lecture, is simply be aware of the different measurement techniques that exist for solar cells, uh, particularly efficiency. And please appreciate that efficiency measurement is very dependent on the source spectrum. Uh, and then there's of course a quantum efficiency measurement. And both of these require some interesting optical systems like a solar simulator or a, a, you know, monochromator for the quantum efficiency measures. So just appreciate the instrumentation that you might, uh, if you ever worked in the field, you, you know, you try to characterize solar cells. Don't, one thing if you take away from this lecture is that don't treat uh, these instruments as black boxes. Try to understand what's going on inside the instrument so that way you can actually make use of the instrument better and also appreciate the data much better. Okay, I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions. Can you explain this chart one more time? Uh, Aprithim, can you repeat that? Uh, he asks you to explain this chart once more. Sure. So this is the uh, the vertical axis, the responsivity. So so the unit, of course, you can plot this in many different ways, but the units here is the amperes per watts. Okay. Uh, you can all, except except for the spectrum. The spectrum, of course, is normalized, right? So not, not terribly important. The horizontal axis is wavelength. So the the blue part, dark blue, is the solar radiation spectrum. So we, that's just the incident light. So if you look at this curve, what does it mean? So this is showing that the SIGS, uh, uh, CIS, CDS cell produces this much current as a function of what? So let's say a thousand nanometers, it produces roughly, you know, 75.75 amperes per watt at thousand nanometers. Now, if you reduce it to 900 nanometers, it produces slightly less current. If you reduce it to 500 nanometers, it produces a lot less current. So that's that curve here. It's, it's effectively a measure of the quantum efficiency of the cell. And all it's showing is that different materials have different responses. So this is CIS, CDS. This is gallium arsenide. 
This is amorphous silicon. So what this is saying is that we have to be aware of this spectral response curve for the particular cell that you're measuring because that will also dictate what wavelengths we need to measure over. Now, we will take advantage of this fact in the next lecture where we will try to optimize the illumination for each cell to take advantage of the fact that different cells work better under different illumination conditions. Okay. Um, anything else?